Welcome to my house here in Sugarloaf, New York. It's a marvelous peak of Indian summer day. Amazing and clear, beautifully clear. And uh, I'm going to show you around the studio. So John, I would like you to first of all talk about this work. It's your second masterpiece and the name is Moment of Expansion. Would you please explain a little bit why you named this piece Moment of Expansion? What does that mean, expansion? You can see um, here it starts, uh, it starts in a frame as a very small thing and then it grows until it exceeds the boundaries. Uh, of the frame it's in. Of the expansion series, there are a lot of readings. This one appears kind of architectural and industrial, and uh, the reading I like to give it is about how our present um, economic systems are all about growth. At some point, according to the metaphor of this piece, we will reach a point where we've expanded beyond the frame of what we're able to contain. Mm -hmm. In other words, uh, we may be using more resources than we have. Uh, uh, we may be putting out more pollutants than that will ch change the frame of the natural world. We need to think about how much humans are expanding, how much industrial society is expanding, how much our resource consumption is expanding. So it's also for formally, it's just interesting to see an element of that's in framed overcome the bounds of the frame. I think that's a, as a as a formal artistic property. I think that's fascinating, right. and it makes the piece asymmetric and non-rectangular which I also think are really interesting these days because, um, you know, when we're in an era of saws and woodworking tools that were easy to make corners and square things, and now we're at a point where we can use a machine mm -hmm. and design software to make any shape and any depth that we kind of can think up. And so I think that um, the artists are just beginning to explore kind of shaped and non-rectangular works because mm -hmm. the possibilities of making them are so much greater. This is a this is a shop bot, a CNC machine. It's controlled by this laptop computer and this big silver control box. The 3D model is translated into uh, X, Y, and Z positions that are uh, actuated by these motors. The motors uh, are given the position, how many rotations they go up and down, back and forth, and the spindle head here goes up and down and back and forth. And the table can go eight feet by four feet by six inches up and down. And from the raw car piece, it gets sanded, filler, and then primer, and then color, and then laminate if necessary. And it, I, cut, I cut a piece of wood to go on the back, and then we hang it with that. It's a one-eighth inch uh, ball nose bit that moves over about a thousandth of an inch each pass. And uh, it carves kind of from the side and the bottom. To do a four by eight sheet takes, um, you know, five or six days of that kind of carving. The material is HDU, high density urethane. My understanding is that instead of predetermining a work, 
or assuming that I uh, uh, understand what meaning I want to convey, I discover that. The meaning of working with the process for me is finding an everyday creative activity that, uh, that becomes my process for working. So the daily drawings and through um, being open to anything that can occur, I discover what's on my mind or what I'm, I have tendency to do or how the weather's influencing me or how the light is influencing me. I see, I see that reflected in the work. And so what becomes persistent in that, in that part of the process, um, gets enlarged and amplified in the bigger works. So I'm not sitting and saying, I have this to say about the world, the world should be this way. I don't mm -hmm. feel that way. What I feel like is, how is the world? And I think that's sort of a process-oriented approach to like, I, I will join in that process of cr creation that's going on around me and participate in that process of creation that's going on around me. And from that will come the work. And not everybody likes spinach, I guess. Yeah, actually, and some people really don't like eggs. It's true. Oh, yeah. My brother won't, doesn't so like much. eggs. Hmm. Hi, Daddy. It's wow. my daughter, Dannery. Hmm. How was your acting class? Good. It was good? Okay. Good. Glad you had fun. Hmm. Honk. 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 <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to do it. I don't need you. Still a few. Fresh. Late in the season, but they're good. Yum. In the middle of the season, we get, I don't know. Raspberries in the backyard. Ooh, this one's nice. <laughs> Put these in the first year and have done nothing to them since, and they grow back every year. Complex City was the emergent piece from the meditation and the sketching, looking out onto the city. 35th Street, uh, factory windows and buildings. Yeah, so the environment has an impact for sure. Yeah, sometimes I'm walking around and I looked at that shape that, that's in the new piece, that big curved frame shape. And then I said, oh, yeah, that looks like the driveway. <laughs> Doesn't it? It looks like that hooked driveway, I know. So uh, you wouldn't even think about it when you're doing it, but if you see a shape often, you become familiar with it. And then when, some, when it comes up in the work for another reason, you're familiar with it, I think. And, but even not knowing that that's where it's from, you're, it just seems familiar. And so you tend to... It tends to weight that shape more in your decision making. So it's fun. If you really can let go and just go with, uh, with uh, your instinct, you can go with your intuition and just do what's fun and just kind of play with it. Later you'll see shapes. And then when you make the connection to your life with those shapes, it tells you things about what you pay attention to or what sits in your mind. And they can be more and less significant, like the no self in the center of the cycle that eventually came out. Was, it's actually a real teaching. It's actually an Eastern teaching about no self being constructed by the things in your life. But that kind of open meditative thinking has been going on <laughs> for a long time, thousands of years. And, and that when you connect with uh, people who know those traditions, you find out, yeah, those, some of those, those milestones that you cross are similar or maybe the same. So interesting. I found that I find these days I find that really interesting to see where the crossovers are. Like where does creativity emerge from? Why do I feel like I need to make things? So I spend a lot of time trying not to analyze it or not to explain it, but just to sit in it, sit in that arising. Because for one thing, it's amazing to, to feel that. And the other is that these cards come out and drawings come out. And it used to be in the beginning, you can see in every icon, it was a completely conceptual process. It was really analytical process. Like I'm going to write a computer program, which is a set of instructions, and it's going to produce all these. And you see how that gets, gets blown apart. There's something more going on. Then when you open to the, what's more going on, it never stops opening, it seems like. It's just, where do these decisions come from? Who are you? <laughs> that kind of thing.
if you draw every day, some things become persistent. Some motifs become persistent. Those are the ideas I pay more attention to. So this box is just filled with um, expansion ideas on and on. When I got to, I don't know what, 50 or 100, <laughs> it was time to, time to make them bigger. That's, that's one of the best criteria I use for what to enlarge. So that is the sketch for the piece that was in the house. In the early going in the expansion series, I didn't understand the nature of the frame. I knew it was frame, but when I actually had to make them bigger, I had to resolve what that was, what that frame was. That turned out to be a really key element. And did the frame, was the frame being broken or was it overflowing the frame? So there's a different uh, meanings that way. And in some cases it does one, in some cases it does the other. And now the frame is getting caught up in the expansion itself, part of that. And how would it be fabricated? So in the beginning I thought I'd have to fabricate the body of it the expansion of it and the frame separately, but I actually had a conversation with the framer, Jed Bart, and he said, and in fact, in Roman times, they would carve the frame and the panel of the same piece. Aha, <laughs> perfect. So, so it's just masked and painted differently, but so, you, so it's all one solid piece. That seemed to be the right way to do it. Same here, the frame and the, and the panel are all the same. And that's an interesting idea that they're all the same. Come and underneath they're all the same substance. So I like that a lot. This is a piece that was shown at the Phillips collection in Washington, DC. I chose a work from the collection, a Kandinsky, and then I brought work in and made work in response to that and it was all displayed together. The symmetric pattern here is based on the pattern in the stairwell of the Phillips collection, the woodworking. So it kind of matched up and this is uh, very typical of the style I'm doing now called the uh, expansion series. So some, uh, something is initiated in a frame and uh, grows eventually to exceed the boundaries of the frame. That's the, roughly what the theme is. But it, it's applicable to, say, for instance, uh, uh, a river which is within its banks and then floods or reaches the, the ocean and expands into a delta in this case. So the, the context of the frame might be this, this thing, this moving, changing, ever-changing thing we call a river until it reaches some point and then we call it something else. So that's an expansion of the frame in which it's understood in. The drawing was made on a card, 5 by 6 card, as part of a daily improvisational drawing practice. And then from the drawings that are similar and the themes that remain persistent, there, certain ones are chosen. This was chosen. Then it's taken to Adobe Illustrator and outlined. And then it's taken to a program called Rhino, where all the 3D elements are pulled out and sculpted. And then it's taken to the CNC machine to create the surface relief. And then in some cases here was airbrush painted or hand painted and then these surfaces are formica. And they're cut and adhered, so it's kind of a collage. This is where I improvise and you can see there's a lot of sort of rejects and experiments that go on and I sit here, get centered, calm, clear the mind and then uh, I hold the pencil or the brush and I let whatever happens and hopefully, I have no idea, hopefully I will, something will come up which I have no idea what's coming. And I'll just let that happen for as long as it can happen and then um, at that point shift attention back to looking at what it is or how to finish it or where it wants to go and then try to oscillate a little bit between letting it flow and then looking at it and um, then when it's done, you know, you have that sense, you develop that sense of when a piece is done and then you just let it go. And then at the end of the day, I pick one and I put it through the scanner and I put it online and write about it or write, do some writing and then keep going. So there are stacks of cards that don't actually make it into the daily drawing. Then there's the, there's the whole 2,000 now, over 2,000 cards that have been put online. 
and then I sort them. It's really nice because it's non-linear random access to the cards, whereas when, you, when I worked in a, a notebook, you know, it was always flipping around. It was hard to see things side by side from different times, but this way. When I'm ready to work, I take cards of a similar theme and I put them out and sort them and mix them and change them. Find, oh look, this was done two weeks ago and this was done a week ago and there's something emerging. There's some shape that's emerging. So what is it in the subconscious that needs to explore that shape? And there might be two and there might not come back again or there might be ten. At that point you start to take it more seriously and try to think a little bit more about it or delve into it or experiment with the form and it may eventually become a larger work. So you were going through three processes. <laughs> you were going through your own creative process and you were going through the process of knowledge about the world yeah. and more specifically about yourself. It's a yeah. self-exploration yeah. process. Yeah, it right? is. It is. But there's, the boundary dissolves at some point. You see, that's one of the beauties of it is that you surrender to the pr creative process around. I mean, I'm growing every day. I'm not trying to grow. Mm -hmm. I'm getting older. I'm not trying. I'm not doing that, but I am. You grow constantly. Gr you constantly, yeah. yeah. And the plants around us are growing constantly, and right. the, you know, the, and the, the world changes. Even just even in destruction, isn't something new. So a building falls down. There's a new open lot. Mm -hmm. So I'm just kind of in my own evocation of creative growth on, on the page. I'm getting in tune. Like you said, there's an insight that comes from observing that process, mm -hmm. and then you start to see it around you and how everything is kind of allowing change to happen. At some point, the self and the larger process, you know, the boundaries kind of get dissolved and you mm -hmm. just feel like I'm moving forward in, in this creative growth of the world. An individual who doesn't have much experience with the visual art and is not necessarily visually literate is going to respond immediately to gross aspects like the size of it, the color of it, is it shiny, mm -hmm. is it, do, do I get it, this kind of thing. And right. this, this piece has been very well received from, by everybody. You know, I think it's beneficial to everyone to see that it's just little bits every day and how the discovery is made because people will start mm -hmm. to see and cooking a meal as creative discovery to be made mm -hmm. or even deciding what to cook. If you can see people paying great attention to the creative process every day, mm -hmm. the way they work and what they discover and how they discover, you can, mm -hmm. you can find those creative parts of your life which is every part, mm -hmm. uh, and hopefully pay more attention to them. That brings, I think that brings mindfulness, which I think is helpful all around. Well, influences the way that public perceives the art, yeah, how so. they understand the art. It takes you down from this kind of ivory tower that I have access to some kind of knowledge that mm -hmm. not everybody does, which is not true, or that I have some authority, which is not there, or that I have something to say as an order, something declarative that, that I don't, mm -hmm. it's really, it's what you see is that when you evoke and when you're open to something new, these things grow. There's nothing greater than daily practice of creative work. I think if you can get people to understand that the riding your bike, gardening, yeah, any uh, uh, drawing every day, taking a photograph, just being attuned at some point to being open to all possibility or just mm -hmm. allowing new things to happen. I think that that's a wonderful thing all around. So certainly for artists, right. there's a lot to be said for just giving permission to young artists to do whatever they want. Mm -hmm. And part of that is process. I'm not saying what you have to present in class is a finished work, which has a finished meaning and a set mm -hmm. meaning and all your decisions have been made. You can say, bring to class the results of the experiments that you've made over time and we'll mm -hmm. see how the process is growing. Yeah, I think that's a good way to teach. I think it's interesting because I do it every day, but maybe if you don't mm -hmm. draw every day but you still want that experience of watching something unknown emerging, right. 
that I mean we're in a different world so who, who knows what art patronage will be and what, what so process may become the more meaningful thing than owning the object is just being a part of the process When we talk about the awful problems that, that we've already defined them to a great extent, in other words, we've already put the frame so tightly around them that it seems like, because in the context of this frame, how do we get out of, you know, global deficit banking? Because the frame is very tight. And, and to open the frame at all means that somebody's going to lose money or something's going to stop for a while, and that's been a big danger. We have to be um, mindful of the whole, the all, all that we can be, as open as we can be. But that's, you know, how do you, I don't know. What, what is, what is, you know, even the pro, even like your neighbor, I mean, just openness is all I can say. It's really hard to say because it means I have to give up something. It seems like a position of weakness and somehow weakness is characterized as bad or oh, openness is characterized as bad if we give up. If I give up something so you can have something, is that a bad thing? If, if we can't live with that, how can we get along? I don't know. We have to, we have to be more compassionate toward each other. It's really hard. It's hard to not have what you want slightly, <laughs> even. Becoming a parent, you learn how to do things for their benefit that's not necessarily your benefit. You sacrifice in that way. <laughs> that you do get some chemical, especially in the beginning, you know, when you hold a baby and you just have this the smell and they just must be firing a hundred different endorphins and dopamines or whatever like good the good feelings you get are so incredible so um yeah i think that's, that's what they call mirror neurons i don't really know anything about them but they say if you if you witness an act of uh, uh generosity you know you, you mirror to that i think uh if you want to solve things uh mindfulness is a great a great thing like people i know who who can be aware of their own thinking and their own feelings in a way that they not attached to them and they're not reactive, you know, or easier to work with, more open to work with. We, we have to come to the realization that we're using more resources, probably, than we can, than the world has. We should wake up and think, how can we run things better? But mindfulness is a good thing, I'll say that, toward that, toward that issue. Mindfulness is, a, is kind of amazing. Well, creative solutions is part of that, I think, yeah. Well, you see, you see great, you know, you see at the same time you see destruction and hatred, you see amazing technology and you see amazing inventiveness. And if people really go back and rethink a problem outside the frame, you know, they come up with other ways to generate electricity and they come up with other ways to build houses and they come up with much more efficient things. I think with the problem... The problem kind of has to present itself to the point of crisis, and then that's kind of how we work, right? <laughs> I don't know. It has to be that way, but that's kind of how it is. Uh, hmm.